Welcome to the Vortex Nation podcast brought to you by lovers of hunting, shooting, public lands, the Second Amendment, and good food. All right, everybody, Mark Boardman here leading off the Vortex Nation podcast. Welcome. We've got Jim Hamilton here. Howdy. Sitting right beside me. Eric Barber. Right here. And present. Dan Storm from the Wisconsin DNR. Welcome, Dan. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Yeah, no, appreciate you taking the time to come out. So, Dan, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your role at the Wisconsin DNR. Sure. So I'm the Wisconsin DNR's deer and elk research scientist. So I cover the entire state and I head up the, the deer and elk research programs and do some consulting with our wildlife management partners on the deer and elk program. So we met last week, I believe. Mm-hmm. Or, or Jim and I met you last week for the first time. Yeah. Eric was uh, there too. Eric yep. was Eric was there, mm-hmm. but uh, he knows you from his previous mm-hmm. uh, career work at the so Wisconsin DNR. Talking like a late May time frame because we were up to we were doing or assisting with the font search, mm-hmm. font survey. Yep. So what? Tell us a little bit about that. You know, number one, it was really cool. It was super fun to participate in. It was really neat to see. Mm-hmm. It was awesome to see the work that you guys did. I'll say in a very expeditious manner, but tell us about the fawn survey and mm-hmm. and that whole program. Yeah, so the the purpose of that, which you you guys are helping us with, is is catching newborn white-tailed deer fawns and putting collars on them for a survival study for us to be able to estimate the summer survival rates of white-tailed deer fawns. And then, so we put a collar on them. The collar's got a switch in it which can detect the motion. So if the collar becomes motionless, then we know the fawn has died. We go find it, and then we can usually, well, we try to, to determine how it died. So at the end of the summer, we'll know, like, what proportion of the fawns lived, which what died, and we'll have some at least a sense of what was killing them. So, yeah, that's what you guys helped us with. It's not easy to catch fawns. They're tiny. They're curled up in the grass and the vegetation, so you need a big army to go out and search for them. And, yeah, that's what we were doing. So... Yeah, and so that's the main purpose. It's tied into our, our larger deer project. It's the we call it the Southwest Wisconsin Chronic Wasting Disease Deer and Predator Project. It's a big, big project looking at deer dynamics in the chronic wasting disease endemic zone, looking at how chronic wasting disease may or may not be impacting deer populations, but also not wanting to look at chronic wasting disease in a vacuum, look also considering predation and um, hunting for sure and habitat sort of holistically looking at the deer population, but doing so where chronic wasting disease is really entrenched in Wisconsin. Okay. All right. Yeah. I mean, to draw, to draw a picture for the folks out there who are listening, if you've ever been on a deer drive while hunting, I feel like we were driving fawns and catching them for research. Yeah, sort of. It, it felt like one of the most primal forms of like search and catch <laughs> that I've <laughs> ever done. I mean, it was like people getting in a line, which we had a pretty big army of people oh, yeah. out there. There yeah. was like 20 people plus, maybe. Yeah, there was a lot uh, of volunteers. Yep. Getting in a big line and, and walking through some thick, thick brush, timber. Nasty stuff. Yeah. Nasty stuff. Lots of mosquitoes. <laughs> lots of rain. And uh, lots of rain. But then all of a sudden, it was like you'd hear somebody fall. Yep. And there's the whole place would just converge, and then the DNR guys would run out there, sprint after him, and watch him like, oh, get after these fawns. And yeah, I mean, it was crazy. That was awesome. Like, hand, you're hand catching deer. Yep. Yes. Babies. Yep. Little baby deer. Yeah. And, and often getting outrun by them. That's yep. the funny thing. You've mm-hmm. got these things that weigh, you know, 15 pounds maybe at that age, and they're just busting loose. And I think you saw us get made fools of a few times <laughs> by those things. How about that? Something that's only like weeks old is already oh like less than that a even yeah. days yeah. old it, days yeah, old yeah yeah it doesn't take long it doesn't take long if they're in that five to six kilogram range or larger you have a tough time catching them you got to catch them sleeping Jeez. yeah it's, it's like, like a Easter egg hunt but yeah. Easter eggs can run away <laughs> 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 yeah they were pretty spry man I was I was I was shocked at their level of of speed and yeah. agility. And just and just those instincts, man. They're like, I'm, you know, I'm out of here. So, how does the fawn search tie into the overall deer study then? Yeah. So, fawn, fawn survival is one of the pieces of what we call recruitment, which is how many new deer do we add to the population every year. That's a function of pregnancy rates, basically litter size, you know, twinning triplets versus singlets, and then you know how many of those they hit the ground, how many of those survive to the fall hunting season. And we call that recruitment. 
and so how it's tied to the research project and how it might be tied to, for instance, the chronic wasting disease and its impact on deer is, so chronic wasting disease is of concern because it kills adult deer. So there's that, because it does that, there's just at least, at the very least, potential for that to impact deer populations, right, through increased mortality. But the sustainability of any mortality source or rate has to do partly with how much, how fast you're adding new ones to the population. So the mm-hmm. higher the recruitment, the higher mortality can be sustained. Right. Right. So that's, so that's part of it. So that's, that's why understanding like the fawn survival rate is an important piece of the puzzle. Because if we've got really low survival, fawn survival, lower pregnancy rates versus high fawn survival, that matters. That tells us something about what we can sustain from, from chronic wasting disease or even hunting. And then when you, you guys were doing a lot of work to the fawns. Mm-hmm. When, you know, mm-hmm. you'd catch them, you know, walk us through yeah. that process of like, once the fawn is caught, process of, I guess, you know, subduing or calming yep. the deer down. And you guys had some tagging going on, some mm-hmm. other things. What what measurements and other things yeah. were you taking Yeah, walk you through the whole thing. So usually, so first of all, like you said, we're searching. We're usually trying to be semi-organized, fingertip, fingertip-ish if we can, searching really comprehensively, although you do walk by most of them. But so you see one. Hopefully it's la- curled up. You just grab it, and we're, and everybody's wearing latex gloves the whole time. Um, Can't even wear bug spray. We didn't want. Which yeah, we, we found out. Yeah, right. <laughs> on a day where the mosquitoes were out. Oh bad. yeah. In yeah. Anyway. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> I, I still have some nightmares over what we experienced in the <laughs> mosquitoes. Anyway, so yeah, so and that's just a scent minimization, scent transfer minimization thing, not to unnecessarily add scent to the situation. So. Anyhow, so we grab them. If they run, the DNR folks will try to catch them. Sometimes they're successful, usually not. But actually, we had some success catching runners when you guys were out, so that was pretty cool. But all right, so we got the fawn now. Some of the, our DNR folks have got a backpack with a full capture kit. So the first thing we're going to do is we take a kid's sock that we've cut the end off and slide it over their eyes. That's just a little bit of a calming, calming thing, just like putting blinders on a horse, you know, just cover their eyes. So um, we'll do that. Then they're going to pull out what we use as laundry bags and then a scale, and we weigh them, just get a body weight. And that, you know, that helps us with, you know, how healthy the fawn is, maybe how old it is. You know, we can tell, you know, when we're catching really young ones, they're usually in three, low three kilogram weights. That's what we kind of see. So knowing that is helpful, knowing whether they're underweight, for instance. So, so we weigh them. Then we'll slip that radio collar over their, ne- over their head. So the radio collar, like I said, it's got that mortality switch. It's got a VHF uh, radio beacon in it. So it's sort of like the deer has a radio station hanging from its neck. That's just got its own frequency. And then we've got a radio receiver, and we can dial it to the frequency of that collar. So every single collar has its own frequency. So we know, all right, deer 150.503, we caught it here. So we drive, you know, in subsequent days, we'll drive that spot and listen for it. If it's alive, it'll be a beep, beep. Beep. If it's dead, it'll be beep, 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 beep. So then we know, all right, mm. let's go find it. So that's the collar. The collar is elastic material, and then it's got a bunch of folds sewn into it. Mm-hmm. And the, the sewing, the stitching in the folds has varying length, uh, degrees of strength. And so as the fawn grows, because it's got to be, it's got to fit relatively tight on a baby, right? Um, it's got to grow with the deer. And so it does. It's designed to grow with the fawn, and it does that over time. And it'll be, you know, it could be if the fawn, if the deer lives, it can be with them. We still have fawns that we caught since 2017 that still are carrying their collars. They'll just slowly, the collar will slowly degrade and get snagged on something or just break off or whatever. So, but that's the collar. We ear tag the fawns. So there's a small plastic, like a sheep style, that what they might use for sheep, livestock tag. We put one in each ear. Those have u- unique numbers and and what we call it it's like their social security number so there's a four digit number and every deer will get its unique number no other deer will have that same number so all the data we collect goes into a database and so now we can look up 5062 all right it was you know a male caught on this date yada yada and then what happened to it what was its ultimate fate so that's how we track them in this database and so we've got the ear tags and we use one in each year for redundancy there's a small chance that they might lose their ear tag, for instance. So that's why we have two. When we're taking the, putting the ear tag in, before we do that, we'll take a small 
section of the ear of just like a little circular punch out of the cartilage of the ear, which is creates the hole for one of the ear tags. And that little piece of tissue is for genetic testing. So, and there's a ton of stuff you can do genetics. Principally, our interest is the fact that there's some genetic variation in susceptibility to chronic wasting disease. There's no immunity, but some deer get it more readily than others. And if in these quote unquote resistant types, um, if they get it, they'll get it. Uh, the disease course can be longer. So we want to know how that might affect survival, for instance. And so every deer we catch has got a genetic sample. And these are all things you can find out later on where you might find a deer that had got CWD. Yeah. Maybe it has a tag. And then you can say, okay, this one had this genetic sample that we got back when we yep. back when we found this fawn. Yeah, was it regular type or resistant type or whatever? And then we can relate that to other all these other things, survival and hmm the chances of them having um, eventually gotten chronic wasting disease or not. Yeah, so that's that. And then um, we look at the umbilicus, where the umbilical cord was. You know, when they're born, the doe is going to bite that off and, you know, she's going to consume the placenta and stuff to clean up the area. But that, we look at that. Is it wet still? Is it dried? Is it scabbed? Is there a little umbilical cord piece left? And how? what's the nature of that? And we kind of record observations on that. And that, that also has a lot to do with age. If it's really fresh, it might still be wet and not have fully scabbed over. It, it scabs really quick, but um, that so that's something that we look at. And then the last thing we do is we measure the hind foot length, which is just another measure of, like, how big they are. And we can do all that in, like, four minutes, usually. It happens quick. It's turn and burn. I mean, that fawn is not is not in your clutches very long. No. Yeah, I mean, it's fairly simple. I mean, it, I described it. It sounds like a lot, but we're bam, bam, bam. Someone's got the data sheet, someone's loading up the ear tag applicator, someone's uh, getting the GPS coordinates where I'll kind of converge, knock it out quick, and, and get the fawn back to, you know, snoozing. And if, you know, if the fawn's, you know, we, we always, like you mentioned, we've got had volunteers. We've got a lot of volunteers because you need a lot of people to catch fawns. You just can't send five employees out. you got to have an army. So we've got a lot of volunteers that come out, and volunteers want to get photos of the fawns. And if so we make a determination, all right, is the fawn really calm, which is a normal thing for a fawn just to not really move. And if that's the case, we may give some folks opportunities to hold the fawn. If it's bucking and squirming and stuff, which is also normal, then we won't do that. We'll just let it go. But regardless, it's a really quick process. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, that was really cool to see. In and out. And, uh, I mean, we got to hold one that was pretty calm. Yep. Yeah. And uh, it, got, it got passed around him. It was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, holding a uh, deer. Yeah. You never really think it's of awesome. that too much. Even if you're not a hunter, you see deer all the time on the side of the road. Yeah. And uh, they're almost just like this distant, untouchable animal. That, But then you're right there and you're holding one. It's crazy. Yeah. That was, pretty, that was my first time holding one. And that was, that was pretty cool. Yeah. Man. They're neat. Yeah. yeah. That's that's the coolest part for me is like, you know, you see people of all different interests. You got guys that are diehard deer hunters. You got people out there helping out who just like animals, want to be outside. So it's not necessarily a hunter, non-hunter thing. Mm -hmm. You just get all kinds of people that, you know, want to help out and they're all on yeah. the same team. Which and, is you, and you mentioned like conditions can be really brutal and we're not walking through easy stuff always. And so we're putting people through their paces and you know, I'm, a lot of people are always like, why did I do this? But then as soon as they get to see a fawn, then they got the smiles, you know, and they're totally like, worth it's it. all worth it. That's We get that all the time of just like trudging, trudging for hours. And then all of a sudden they're just, they just light up and it was, oh, it was the greatest thing ever. And so it's, it's really, and it's really cool to get, you know, people have that connection, mm -hmm. get that connection. Cause you're right. It's, it's really neat having, yep. getting your hands on a live deer like that. For sure. I mean, I think, you know, Going off what you said there, I think another thing that's cool is I think it, for some folks who may not hunt, it's hard to understand, you know, hunting in general, but you've got a fairly large constituent of hunters out there helping with these surveys and gathering this data. And it's because because they care about the, the deer that, yep. as a resource, but you don't have a vested interest, you know, in those deer, but not necessarily from a, you know, self-serving, but mm -hmm. like from a holistic approach, yep. you know. Yeah, totally. And at the end of the day, it's just flat out fun. Like it's cool to get out there and, you know, cover some country and all of a sudden a lot of helter skelter breaks out. You yeah. catch one and, you and know, you get really good at spotting stuff. Yeah. Yep. Keep, yeah. Keeping your eyes peeled. That's not the only way that you go about capturing deer for monitoring. Right now the the fun, the fun search like we did, that's that's like an early, early way of doing it. But there are other ways that you guys use to 
Yeah, so kept. with respect to Fonz, you mean? I or guess just, I guess oh. fawns are just in in general like that's not the only way that you would get yeah. data on a deer, right? Or yeah, so there's a f- just real quick with fawns, and you actually you saw it, which was when we were driving to the spot, we saw a doe right by the side of the road. Yeah, as soon as we slowed down, she ran off, but she turned around immediately, and we we're like, oh, she's got a fawn right there, and so we all hopped out, searched the ditch, found the fawn. So we call those road fawns. We get a few of those. <laughs> <laughs> what we've done, a roadie, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So th- and those are always a good, like, essentially bonus fawns, right? Because you didn't hardly have to work for them. But um, what I'll describe in a second is how we catch deer in the winter. And when we do that, we're putting GPS collars on them. And so you can program the collars to get GPS fixes on each deer. And that gets those locations get uploaded via satellite. And we can log on and look, select the deer we want and look at her, her points, you know, with a lag of maybe half a day or so. So we can see where she was yesterday, more or less. So what we did there, when we've used that, so we'll catch deer in the winter, have the GPS locations on, now we're getting locations every two hours. And so now we can use that to our advantage because we got a doe and all of a sudden we see her points are really clustered. And so now we've got some intel of maybe there's a fawn there because what you find is that, you know, they're moving their, their regular daily movements and then when they're dropping a fawn, oftentimes they're really they'll really just clamp down for a few hours maybe. And so you see this cluster of points and then bam, we'll go out there and do a search. And that's a way to make us a little more efficient. So that's been pretty cool. How do you go about catching a doe in the winter? All right. So in the winter time, and this is actually a bigger operation. Do you guys ever do it when it's like just, you know, nice early spring or, you know, like early fall when the weather's... No. (laughs) It's got to be sub-zero or it's got to be raining and mosquito and hot. No, yeah, exactly. So (laughs) we catch deer in the winter. We start maybe late December, early January, and we'll go through March. And what we're doing there is we're catching deer, catching adult deer and putting these GPS collars. Otherwise, the process, like I described with the fawns, is fairly similar. Genetic sample, weight body measurements and stuff, but putting a GPS collar on them instead of the little VHF collars. And so catch those a variety of ways. We use what we call netted cage traps. So you'll have a property that may have like a trail network, and then you'll put, first of all, yeah. so you put these traps out there. They've got a metal frame, and they've got netted nets on the sides, the top, back, everything in front. And then it's got a trap door, so the, the one end will be open, and then that's connected to a trip wire that's two-thirds, three-quarters of the way to the back, and behind the tripwire we'll put corn bait. And so the deer will come to get the corn, and they'll hit the tripwire, the door will shut behind them, and then they're trapped. The next morning, we're going to run this. So we, get, we put them out, we string these out maybe a couple hundred yards apart. So we'll hopefully have a big property. For, this works for really big properties that have good like trail networks, the ATV trail networks and stuff. So we'll set a trap line property may have a dozen or six or 18, depending on how big it is. And then we'll get hop in our UTVs and, and drive the trap line. If there's a deer in the trap, someone's going to get out. They're going to have a UTV helmet or ATV helmet on, um, go in the trap, subdue the deer, kind of get the deer on the ground, get on top of the deer. And then someone's going to come up behind them and they got, they're, they're drawing up drug. So we're going to tranquilize all these deer and we're drawing up the tranquilizer drug injecting that into their muscle mass and then we just wait about five minutes until the deer go under and then we pull the deer out of the trap and and work it up so that's one way we do it the other way we we do it is what we call drop netting so you'll take a big a net so you take a flagpole you're suspending a giant net from a flagpole then it's kind of the end the edges are tied to t uh t posts so you got you got this tent canopy sort of thing but it's a net and then in the middle of that We'll put corn bait, you know, corn bait. So the deer will come uh, under the net to the bait when they're feeding. Then we've got a trigger mechanism. So, so, so in that scenario, someone's in a blind, mm-hmm. a hunting blind or a tree stand or, or a pickup or whatever, depending on the scenario. And then they'll drop the net. The deer will get tangled up. We'll run up, drive up, and inject each deer with drug, untangle them, and then work them up. Hmm. So, yeah. We were discussing, actually, when we were out there, too, that, like, for those listeners watching out there who are human, if you ever find yourself being abducted by aliens, <laughs> really, in some ways, probably, they're just trying to do the same thing we're trying to do these days. probably <laughs> just trying to research us. So, I mean, just, it, it's cool. It's fine. After <laughs> watching that, it makes some of those stories seem a little bit more plausible. It does. Yep. It does. You know, and I think, really, they just want to make sure that we're doing okay. Yeah. Yep. 
but <laughs> thanks, aliens. <laughs> Random side note there. But so so when you're catching and, and collaring these adult deer, are you monitoring the exact same things that you are with the fawns? Or are you getting some different information? You know, I guess outside of, you know, your finding that information where that doe may be likely to drop that fawn, what else are you getting? What other kind of data are you getting? Yeah, so one additional thing we do when we catch these deer in the wintertime is that we'll take a little biopsy actually from the rectum. It's, it's, it's a tiny piece of tissue about the size of a dime nickel. And that piece of tissue has lymph follicles. So these lymph follicles, if that's where prions, the, the, the agent that causes chronic wasting disease, may accumulate. So if it's got the disease, there's a good chance that we'll find that with that tissue sample. So we'll hmm. take a tissue sample, and then we send it into the lab, in our case, Wisconsin Veterinary Diagnostic Lab. They'll run the tests. And then so while the deer is out there walking around and collecting data, then we know whether or not, or we have a good indication whether or not that deer actually has chronic wasting disease. And that allows us to follow these deer through time and see how their survival rates differ, right? So now the reason we're catching these deer, the big reason is, to, is also like the fawns looking at survival rates and what might be killing them and then how might that differ between deer that have chronic wasting disease versus deer that don't have chronic wasting disease. So similar to the fawn collars where it's sort of based off motion, there's actually has a, an accelerometer in it. When the deer dies, it becomes motionless. And then what we get with the GPS collars is we get a text message and an email. And it'll say deer number 86078, whatever, mortality alert. And then you can go on, you find out where it is, and then we'll do the process of getting permission and, and doing the, the CSI investigation, go out there and figure out what happened to it and bring the, if, if the carcass is intact at all, we'll bring it back to a veterinary pathologist whose job it is to do necropsies on dead animals. And then they help us out and try to determine cause of death and stuff. And so that's the main purpose of it so we can figure out what proportion and when and what are the like the circumstances that uh, make a deer more or less likely to die but with the gps data which is so cool is it also gives us tons of movement data right so we can crank up or crank down the the frequency which at which they get locations and so we can get all sorts of awesome habitat use data movement data looking at dispersal so it's there's the sky's limit with that sort of data and actually we're not just collaring does in the winter, we're calling, collaring bucks too. And so mm-hmm. one of the things that's of interest is looking at buck dispersal. So what happens with deer, bucks especially, is when they turn one year of age, there's a good chance that they're going to leave where they've been growing. So they're born, they're living with mom. The next year on their first birthday, mom's ready to have another baby and she says, hit the road. And so at that point, she's not going to tolerate her son anymore. And he may just take off. I and can relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, coming of age. And so, so there's a chance that he's going to take off, like literally just leave, leave the area and establish a new home range elsewhere. So what percentage do that? How far do they go? What direction? Is there any directionality? What are the factors that can facilitate the movement or hinder the movement, like crossing highways and rivers and just the nature of that dispersal process? Which is, that's important for like, you know, connecting populations that may be fragmented. It could be really important, could be important for transmitting the disease. So some of these animals may walk 30 miles. I mean, it it varies a lot, but trying to get a handle on that. So that's another piece. When you were talking about mortality there a little bit, you know, if a person is hunting Mm -hmm. and they encounter one of these adult collared deer, how should they treat that? So what we want people to do is ignore the collar. That's a great question. That's something that we really want to get out there is what proportion of these deer get shot. I thought that's called, we call that the harvest rate. So the best case scenario for us, the best case is that they don't even see the collar. We hope that they don't even include that in their harvest decision. If they see the collar, if they're aware that there's collared deer, we just ask them that they try to the best they can to not have the collar be a part of their decision to harvest the deer. Right. So it's neither untouchable nor a trophy. Nope, it's not. It's it's neutral. So were you going to shoot it? If so, yes. Were you not? If so, no. Right. And so all we ask is that if they do, give us a call. There's a number on the collar. Give us a call. We'll come collect the collar. And we, we what we'd like to do is just ask a couple of questions, just about like, did you see the collar, for instance, and just kind of the circumstances there, and then. We'll want to test it for chronic wasting disease too. It's important to test them when you catch them, but also catch them when they die. So we try to do that with every single deer 
at capture, at death, because obviously they could be not have the disease when you catch them, but then get the disease at some point. So we want to right. get, get mm-hmm. at that too. And so we'd like to get as many of the deer collared at death as well. So that's, we just call us up. We'll run out there. We'll, one of our technicians will run out there and make it really easy for him and take the lymph nodes and test it for him. So would you say that CWD, because we've kind of hit on that a bunch of times, is that the primary focus of, yeah. of the study? Yeah, that's yeah. why we're doing the study. Yeah. So there's, you know, we've done mortality studies in the past in other parts of the state, but the impetus of the project is the focus of the main question is like, is chronic wasting disease have an impact on the population currently? What is the future of that impact? So is, is CWD, chronic wasting disease, CWD, is that like, I mean, it's something that I've heard a lot more about in relatively recent times. And, you know, I don't know if it's just due to publicity of it or not, but is it, is it something that's new? Has it always been around or? It's probably not always been around. We don't know exactly when it got established in Wisconsin. So it was discovered in 2002 in Wisconsin. Um, It had been discovered long ago in Colorado, like in the 60s in Colorado. So sometimes folks think, well, it's just everywhere. If you find, if you look for it, you'll find it. It's everywhere. And that's not really true because you can look at how we've done our surveillance and you can see there's really strong patterns in the disease. It's not just everywhere. There are places where you look hard and don't find it. There are places where you look hard and you find a little bit of it. There are places where you look hard and you find a lot of it. So there's a spatial pattern and that spatial pattern is changing through time which is to mean that's a, what we call an epidemic where the disease is changing through time. Now it's like a slow epidemic, so it takes a long time. It doesn't, it's not like the flu that rips through a population or something, right? Like no kids are sick, all the kids are sick, and no, no kids are sick again like <laughs> yeah. in a week. So it's like what we call a slow epidemic. But just given that we can observe this spatial pattern that's kind of changing slowly, that, is, that tells us is it's not, quote, always been there. Now how long has it been there? Well, we don't know. It's definitely, I mean, so there's some, there's been some modeling efforts that's tried to take a crack at that. So we know when we found it in 2002, we knew, we know that wasn't the first case, for instance. And usually the first time you find something, a disease, that is not the first one. It's just the first one you found. So then I found it, the agency went hog wild, really sampled hard, found kind of the, had a really good handle on that distribution. And that would have indicated it wasn't brand new. Now, is it a decade old, two decades old, five decades old? That's it's tough to tell. Really hard to tell. So, and to actually, real quick, just even go one step backward too. If, so, if anybody's listening and maybe isn't familiar with what CWD, so when you guys are looking for that, or, or if somebody sees a deer, or, what, what's like? Mm-hmm. What are you finding when you find a deer with CWD? Is what kind of stuff do you see? So you most that a bit? most deer that have CWD, you absolutely cannot tell hmm. because they don't show outward symptoms until they're finally pretty close to end stage. So I'll give you an example. And we've got a bunch of examples like this now, but we catch a doe in February of 2017. She's like 170 pounds, just big, fat, healthy looking doe. Looks awesome. That's a big doe. Three months later, she tipped over, fell down a hill, and she had weighed like 90 pounds. So she lost an incredible amount of weight. Three months later. Yeah. Wow. Incredible amount of weight in three months they just fall off a cliff. They look healthy as, as can be, and then they're dead. And so like, oh, yeah. So the, the question like we get, understandable, under totally understandable question is, well, if it's such a big deal, how come I never see sick deer? Yep. Because they're not outwardly sick for very long. And then the other thing is when they die, they're getting gobbled up by coyotes like that. Like our crew, when we have a dead one, we got to get there fast because there, there's scavengers. Mm-hmm. And so – that's also why, you know, you don't see, if you walk around, you might not find a ton of carcasses because they're getting gobbled up and strewn about really quickly, usually. So the average CWD positive deer looks like a beautiful, healthy deer. Which really makes me as a hunter think about, okay, so now I shoot a deer. That's the incentive for the hunter to get their deer tested mm-hmm. because, you know, you don't know whether you're eating CWD positive meat, you're eating a deer that's not yeah. infected at all. So, I mean, just knowing that that can change so fast and you really can't tell, I guess that's the incentive right there for hunters to get those deer tested. And that's something that's pretty accessible here in in Wisconsin, correct? Anybody that wants their deer tested can get their deer tested. 
it's a matter of just finding where, you know, the finding your nearest location, which you can just go to the DNR's website and you'll find the nearest location you can go to get it tested, but it's free to anybody in the state. But yeah, like, well, it looked healthy. I mean, you mm-hmm. get that all the time. Again, understandably, right? Understandably, because it's a disease that a deer might carry for a year, 18 months, two years, right? It just it got a long latency period. So, but you talk to folks that have been hunting in an area with a lot of, dis- of disease for a long time that have tested a lot of deer, and they'll tell you about all the healthy-looking deer that they shot that were positive. Because hmm. what, could, what could happen if you didn't test your deer and you wound up processing that deer and eating it later on, a deer that had CWD? So that's a tricky question. So it's hard to know exactly what the risks are. I would say it's a very complicated, and again, this is a little bit into my outside of my wheelhouse as a we're getting into the prion, like this little, this misshapen infectious protein. It appears, I mean, the evidence seems like it doesn't readily transmit. We can probably say that there's not, it doesn't just readily transmit to humans or livestock or whatever. Does that mean it doesn't? Does that mean there's no risk? We can't say that. We don't know. Mm -hmm. Honestly, we just don't have the information to say, yeah, don't worry about it. That's my, my understanding of the state of the science is, the risk is not zero. It's probably not high, but we should not ever think it's zero. Hmm. Yeah. So then you just got to make your own judgment. Mm-hmm. You got to weigh the mm-hmm. positives and the risks and the costs and make your own judgment. I mean, you know, the CDC recommends that you don't eat positive deer. Mm-hmm. That's their recommendation and that people take right. it how they want it and make their own decision. Yep. Are there other precautionary measures, you know, that people should maybe be taking or, or that, that are suggested, you know, when handling deer or butchering deer? Um, yeah, the standard stuff is, you know, wear gloves, which is prudent anyway, I suppose. Um, yeah. And they talk about not cutting through the spinal column and stuff like that because it's a prions are in the nervous system. And, you know, that's where they really accumulate and cause troubles in the brain. So, you know, trying to avoid the, those areas when you're cutting up the deer is what the recommendations are. But those are pretty standard sort of recommendations. So now in, in addition to, you know, obviously getting their deer tested, that's probably something that hunters should be participating in or at least really considering it. You know, are there any other things that hunters can be doing to help out? Or Yeah, good question. I mean, I, first of all, if you do see a sick deer, a deer that looks really emaciated, really lethargic, droopy head, droopy ears. If you do see one, I mean, call your local wildlife biologist. The response may be different in Iowa County, southern Wisconsin, where the disease is really entrenched versus some other part of the state where the disease hasn't been found yet, that there may be a different response there, but worthwhile calling if you see a sick deer. And oftentimes what they'll do is someone will come out and dispatch the deer or they'll authorize whoever calls to do it and then they'll get a test. And that's important. So then we the more we can know about where the disease is, the distribution of the disease, and the intensity of the disease, the better, well, sh- the better hunters are prepared to respond, right? You know, other things are disposal of the carcass because, you know, maybe it bears talking a little bit about how the disease is transmitted. So it's transmitted mm-hmm. in bodily fluids, saliva, urine, feces, but, you know, and also... It's, it's, and it's a prion? It's a prion, which, what's a prion? A prion is like a protein of some sort. And okay. We all have prions... Prions are unique, like, I guess you need them to live, right? These are just something went haywire with the prion, and the nature of it is such that it can alter the shape of the other prions, and then that disrupts, I guess, the accumulation or, or whatever in the body, and, and eventually that really disrupts the functioning, the physiology, and the physical nature of, the, like, the brain especially. So you get, like, holes in the brain. It's, like, building up, just kind of interferes with things, and so they're just neurologically not operating well anymore that's kind of what happens but Mm. but it's shed saliva urine feces but then obviously a carcass has it so one of the normal things is you butcher your deer and you toss the carcass in the ravine or whatever right so but there are better ways to do that especially you know there's a lot of people that hunt in iowa county wisconsin and sock richland that sort of area where there's a lot of disease that hunt there live elsewhere Mm -hmm. right so if you take your if you hunt you kill a deer and then you bring it to some other part of the state, other part of the country, you know, it, you could inadvertently be dropping prions wherever you wherever you dispose of that carcass, so you should landfill it. That's the recommendation is landfilling the carcass, boning it out, especially if you can. And, then, and if you're uh, coming from out of state, you you got to check your own state's regulations for transport. Specifically, they may require you to not to bone out your meat 
for instance, rather than mm-hmm. bring in a whole bring in a whole carcass. So you know we really want folks to to keep the deer carcass in the county of kill if they can in those counties where we where CWD is known to occur, and land, basically landfill the carcass. Gotcha. That, that's a really good point because Mark Mark and I were talking about that prior to jumping on the podcast. How you know some different states have different regulations when it comes to transporting deer and whatnot. So I think you know just really being acute to that from yeah. a hunting standpoint, I think that's a pretty big takeaway there. Yeah, and we have people from every state in the nation and many, many countries come and hunt in Wisconsin. And mm-hmm. many of them come to our CWD endemic area. So it'd be really important. If I was if I was working for another state, I would be really trying to educate my hunters that come here, you know, to like about proper carcass handling, you know. Yeah. It's it. pretty wild nowadays. I mean, modern modern technologies and transportation and things like that have let people start hunting all over the world, really. And, you know, yeah. whereas you might have used to back in the day, people just kind of hunted their, their back property, their, uh, you know, their 40 or whatever, and uh, and that was it. But nowadays, yeah, like you said, even just within the state or within the country or even people outside of the, the U.S. come yeah. here to hunt, and, and that, that can present some potential issues. Yep. You know, you're talking about scavenging, too, you know, and, I mean, is there a bridge between scavengers consuming CWD-positive deer and you know, spreading mm-hmm. spreading those prions, you know, potentially through fecal matter or other means. There could be. It's not an area we know a lot about. I mean, it certainly seems like that would be the case. Again, coyotes and coyotes, among other things, well, even eagles and vultures and stuff are e- eating deer carcasses. They are one hundred percent certainly consuming CWD positive deer all the time, right? So, what role they have in th- the disease spread? It's a really open question. We just don't know. I should say, I mean, not to derail things, but like I, we, as a part of the project, we're actually collaring coyotes and bobcats in the area. So I don't know, I um, hadn't mentioned that, but we've got about, we've collared about 40 coyotes last fall, and we've got a couple dozen bobcats on there as well. And so we're trying to study that. But you reminded me of this role of scavenging, and I was thinking, oh, yeah, we had that coyote that walked 30 miles. <laughs> you know, whether that. Collaring those sounds like it'd be a good time. Yeah, 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 and actually, um, with the coyotes especially, we used uh, trappers. So we would put the call out, sign up interested trappers, to si- sign them up, and so all right, we know you're out there trapping for us. Every time you catch a coyote that we can call, it'll pay you ninety nine dollars. And so we had we had really good participation. So they sweet. Yeah, you, you can't beat someone who's been trapping for twenty, thirty years. You know, they're, yeah, they're, they're, they're they know what they're doing. They're and... familiar with the land. They know what they're doing, and so. We had really good participation with that. We ca- collared a lot on our own as well with our own technicians out there, but having those, having the public trapping for us for coyotes was really awesome. And what data are you getting from from the predators? Then? Very yeah. similar stuff in terms of we put a GPS collar on them and look at their look at their movements and look at their mortality and as well. It's very similar stuff. We're not doing this CWD biopsy, right? We're not worried about that with coyotes and bob and bobcats. Again, presumably species barrier. Um, mm-hmm. There, but we are looking at. So, for instance, you know, you got all this. You got this coyote. We know where it is. It's getting locations all the time. We got a bunch of coyotes, a bunch of bobcats. Look at their habitat use. How do they differ between them one another, mm-hmm. for instance? And how does that? If you think about where they prefer and where they don't prefer, and you think about how that might relate to a fawn in the landscape, where are the spots that are more risky for a fawn or less risky for a fawn based on? the habitat preferences of those animals. That's one one potential avenue. So and you, you bring up an important thing about the species barrier there because CWD intrinsically affects cervids like deer and elk, right? As far as we know. Again, as far again, as we know, right? That's right, the, right. There's always that uncertainty there, and we always got to you know keep in mind that uncertainty. But that's known, let's see, you know, obviously whitetail, mule deer, elk, moose, reindeer, so there's they found CWD in Norway in in wild reindeer, and I'm sure there's you know those are the ones that are off the top of my head. All North American cervids are susceptible. Gotcha. That was my you know and maybe there's just there probably isn't an answer to it. But I was trying to yeah. whittle down in my mind like so what's different about you know yeah. animals like deer and elk that maybe you know it's not going to affect a bear or, or yeah and that's I don't know I mean there's so there's the bovine. There's the the cow, mad cow. Right. It's in that sort of family. There's scrapey, which well, is those are sh- similar. 
there, there's there's some similarities there, and they're both like this prion disease. Okay. Um, there's scrapey, which is like the sheep version, mm-hmm. and there's like a mink one that's that's in the mink farm mink industry. I don't think it's wild in wild mink, but it's in the farm mink industry. And I mean, there may be some. I mean, there's this what they call Creutzfeldt Jakob, which is a s- human version, although that's not infectious. As far as we know, that's just like there's like the spontaneous sort of version. So, I mean, it's weird, tricky stuff. It, but there's some pretty critical differences between the mad cow, the bovine encephalopathy, which is that humans, some humans did get that from eating meat. Right. So that happened. Right. 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 Um, not a ton of people, I think. I think it's, I want to say it was probably a small proportion of the people that actually consume that meat, but some people did get it. And again, we have not found that with chronic wasting disease yet and hopefully we'll never hopefully but that was how the cows got it is actually through consumption of animal material so that was how they got it and what makes chronic wasting disease another thing that makes chronic wasting disease distinct from that is that deer can give it to one another so saliva infected saliva from one deer to another through you know the social behavior grooming and all that stuff can lead to transmission potentially or from one animal to the environment to another animal. It's infectious animal to animal in a way that um, is not the case for mad, for mad cow. So now what happens when you have, let's say, a county that hasn't been positive for CWD, you know, ever, and then all of a sudden it has a, a positive show up? What changes then in terms of deer management for that specific county and surrounding and in that, mm. that general area? It depends a little bit on whether it was previously adjacent to a county. We have what we call like CWD affected counties. So if in a county that doesn't have, where we have not found the disease and you're not adjacent to a county, but then you be, then they find one. All right, all of a sudden now a baiting ban, baiting and feeding ban goes into place. So you can't bait, you can't feed deer. And that's for three years if the rules currently, I believe, are then you have three years, and if you don't find any more positives, then that will get lifted. I think that's what the legislation is. Oh, okay, so if you didn't have any CWD in your county, and then all of a sudden you did find one, yep. theoretically, then you have that baiting band. Yes. A ban. Okay. Yes. Not baiting band. <laughs> it's not like a band that comes to town and plays. Hey, that's the new name of your new band, Jim. <laughs> baiting oh, band. And that that's what's interesting to me is, you talked about like nose to nose contact and deer kind of transmitting it from one to the other that way. You know, that is, that's one thing that always comes to mind for myself is, you know, baiting and feeding and that kind mm-hmm. of thing. So just reverting back to things that people can do if they want to suppress the, the disease or, you know, whatever the case may be, that mm-hmm. perhaps may be something that they want to look into. Yeah. So. so it seems like Wisconsin has a pretty prevalent CWD sort of population, if you will. I don't yeah. know if that's the correct term for it, but if you had to draw a map across Wisconsin, what would it almost like a like a heat map? Like a heat map, yeah. If you will, mm-hmm. what does that look like in Wisconsin? And then how does Wisconsin line up compared to the rest of the nation? Yeah, so I I want to say I believe that there has been wild positives found in twenty five of our seventy two counties found. Okay, and so the highest prevalence, the most the areas where the highest percentage of deer are affected are. And where it was initially found, it was initially found in western Dane County, which is just west of Madison. So we're talking southwest Wisconsin. So that area, Iowa, Dane County, and then all, all the counties in that, pretty much all the counties in the southern quarter or so of the state have had at least one positive. But again, like west of Madison, that's where the highest prevalence area is. Basically right where we're at. And that's where we were exactly. doing the uh, phone search. Too. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Yep. yep. And then um, there's another cluster that's not too far away that's in the Bloit area on the Illinois border and, and that's a epidemic we share with Illinois. Illinois has got has had CWD for quite a while too. I think they discovered it maybe just a year after we did. And so northern Illinois um, has it too. And then so back back to Wisconsin, you know they're starting there's a cluster, I believe in Adams County and we just found it in Oneida and Lincoln County last year. Old Clare County is a new one that the in terms of what these are we're talking wild deer that mm-hmm. were harvested by hunters and tested. So it's starting to spread. I mean, it's certainly the, the further north you go and the further away from the southwest you go, the lower the prevalence is, or the the other way to think of it is the the higher the chances of there not really being a disease there. So that's what our current understanding is. Now that's all 
all function of our surveillance. And so our, our information about where the disease is and isn't isn't perfect. We've got a really robust surveillance program, I'd say, but it's not it's by no means perfect. So there could be clusters of disease that we're not aware of, certainly, and that we'll become aware of eventually. That was like the case in by Ryan, Ryan Lander in uh, Oneida County. Guy shot a buck and uh, right outside of Ryan, Ryan Lander had it tested. Boom, it was positive. They decided to, within a certain number of miles around that area, offer some free landowner tags. They had a few landowners, this, this, and that was just this spring, had a few landowners take them up on that and uh, found another positive. So hmm. we'll see. Hopefully we'll get a lot more testing done in that area, but that could be a new kind of cluster of disease. We'll determine that. But, you know, and where I say it is today, <laughs> get, you know, ask me in a year, it's going to be, could be, could be different. So Right. And what does that look like then nationwide? Because you said earlier, for example, if you were uh, in, in another state, for example, doing a yeah. job like yours, you'd be kind of worried about people going to Wisconsin potentially. Yeah. And um, not to dissuade folks from coming and no, hunt in, in our great, great state. state. Come yeah, on out. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. No. Just, you know. I no. still go every year. Yep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Just, uh, you know, know your regulations. But it's not the rosiest picture because they keep finding it in more spots. It's They found it fairly recently in Iowa, wild, and, we're, and again, talking wild deer, wild harvested deer. Iowa and Missouri, if ha- I mean, Missouri's had it for, has known about it for a while. Iowa's now, I believe they've got it in the Northeast, which is sort of adjacent to us. And then they've also now got it coming up in the South Central, I think, from Missouri. Um, they're, they found it in newer spots in Missouri. Um, I mean, I can I can't list all the states now. There's a lot of them. All, most of the Great Plains states have okay. found it. Um, a lot of the Intermountain West, uh, you know, Wyoming and Colorado have been the two that have had it for the longest time that we've known about it, anyhow. But a lot of states now have found it. Mississippi, I believe, just found their first wild case this year. Ar- Arkansas, a couple of years ago, found a case, and then when they started looking, they found that the prevalence was really high. Wow. So, Interesting. yeah. So it's in, you know, they they found it in West Virginia, Pennsylvania. They found it in New York, Michigan recently, actually, in the Lansing area, I want to say. So it's, they're finding it. It's Our, not just Wisconsin. It's not, <laughs> it's not, just, it's not, not just Wisconsin. We're sort of uh, in the Midwest anyway, um, outside of Colorado in Wyoming. We're the furthest along as far as hmm. we know, anyhow. So, and that's what makes the the study, the Southwest yeah. study, so interesting. I mean, it seems like what you guys are doing with that is pretty advanced to, you know, what some other states have been doing. And is, would you venture to say that it's almost kind of like a case study for the rest of the nation? I think so. I mean, I think that a lot of the states, especially the Midwestern whitetail states, are, are looking at what we're doing. And I know that uh, Michigan and Minnesota are both starting projects that are sort of similar Mm -hmm. to what we're doing and we've been talking with those the folks in those agencies and those universities about what they're doing and trying to compare notes and and stuff and so I think yeah I think there's going to be pretty high interest in what we find found because we could sort of be like you know in some ways you could think they're they could look to us and see like okay where are we going to be in 20 years 50 years and I think it'll be useful for them. Yeah. Well, and like you said, too, about for that example in Arkansas, too, I mean, if you wanted to, your state could have no CWD. You just that just means don't look for it. You know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you won't you won't actually know for sure until you start researching and looking for it. You kind of got to look except for the fact, except for when all of a sudden you got a really like the that end stage deer in someone's backyard. Yeah. At some point. You can't. You can't <laughs> you ignore know? it anymore. Yeah, but, right. You know, right. you can try to, but yeah, it, you guys have been doing definitely tons of research. Yeah, and I think and, you know, uh, there's just a you know, natural resources agencies have the view of having okay, we're responsible for our deer herd. It's our it's our job to manage the deer herd, and and even if there is a tiny, even if the again the human health implications are maybe non-existent, there's still that responsibility there of you know, we got to pay attention to this. Right, right. right. Yeah. And, of course, yeah. the potential impact on the deer population, mm-hmm. how that... So I think most states out... Well, I think most states are probably going to be pretty proactive about that yeah. stuff just because yeah. of what their view is their public trust responsibility. Yeah, and, and for the record, I'm not saying Arkansas <laughs> was trying to ignore <laughs> no, that, no, too. No, no, no. But uh, it's, it's just... What do you yeah, have against Arkansas, <laughs> I mean, let's get it out right now. <laughs> Nothing, we, man. We did lose a football coach to go down there, <laughs> Brett, Brett Bielema. That is true. That is Don't want to poke that bear. And they're jumping in with both feet too. <laughs> yeah, 
of going after the disease and trying to learn some stuff too. So yeah, that's great. Are most of the I guess you know the new cases or where it's discovered in, in new new places are those via hunter harvested deer that that state has a testing program in place? Yeah, I would say for the most part that's the yeah that's the case. It's through their their own surveillance systems that they've set up. Gotcha. Yeah. So now, you know, could you talk about, like, the? this is the first year that, that the Southwest study is, you know, cycled a full year, correct? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So what were, you know, year one results? Is that something you can talk about? Or? Yeah, so, you know, we have we still have most of our data collection ahead of us, but we kind of, we like to take some preliminary looks just to keep folks in the loop. So one of the first things we did was we wanted to compare the survival rates of the deer we caught our very first winter in 2017. And again, we've got this, the deer that, at capture were positive and at capture were negative. And I'll right compare those survival rates through time of those animals. So that, that was one of the first things we've done. And so now what did we catch 100 and collared 150 or so deer that first year in that neighborhood, collared them. And 12 of those were positive at capture, which is a small, that's a small sample size. But we compare the survival of those 12 to the survival of the other ones. And we, and at the end of the year, okay, what percentage of each group are, is left? And so what we found, which isn't too surprising, but it is, it's, well, it's, it is what it is. It's unfortunate, which is that the, by the end of the year, three, I want to say three quarters of the positive deer were dead and only one quarter of the negative deer. So we had pretty high survival of the deer that didn't have chronic wasting disease. In fact, our harvest rates were pretty low. It's easy living. Southern Wisconsin's not that harsh. It's phenomenal habitat, some of the best habitat in the country. It's a great place to be a deer. But for those deer that had chronic wasting disease, they had much, much lower survival, which is in line. So there's been similar studies done in Wyoming on mule deer, Wyoming and white-tailed deer and elk in Colorado. And they found similar things where their positive deer died at a much faster clip than their negative deer. Again, that's what you'd expect. There is the possibility that because there's more hunting. So for instance, you know, deer in Western states, there's not as many, there's not as much antlerless harvest as there is in Wisconsin. So there's that chance that because we've got higher antlerless harvest, maybe there is less of a difference between negative and positive deer in survival because we might have higher, just higher overall mortality, which we can sustain because we've got higher recruitment. It just didn't happen to be the case. And yeah, the survival was much, much lower. Now, because again, we only had 12 deer that first year that were that tested positive. That means there's a lot of uncertainty in exist. So we we can say for certain that the survival is lower. The question now is more now in in terms of magnitude. So how much lower? And is that that difference of like say 75 percent annual survival of negative deer versus 25 percent of positive deer is that going to hold or is it going to increase the difference or decrease the difference? And that's what we're going to start to learn. Hmm. I got a question too, and and. MC Ryan here is letting me know that we, uh, we're at about an hour here, but curious because this will be probably another podcast topic in and of itself. We talked about the elk mm-hmm. project going on here in Wisconsin. Now, in reading, as much as I've been able to, I believe that the elk are, they're fairly north yeah. in yeah, Wisconsin, yeah. right? Now, they were introduced to the habitat that they're in currently, Yeah, right? And so did you guys, when it came down to, to sort of finding a spot for them, did the CWD concentration in that area have anything to do with the fact as to where you put them? Did you try and find a place where there wasn't as much or that you had found yet? Or or would they simply just not do too well down in the southern part of the state? It, what kind of... So a few things. There, The initial introduction happened in 1995. And mm-hmm. so that was before we discovered chronic wasting. Oh, okay. And that okay. was up in northern Wisconsin. And so... That's right. The plan, And then the plans for that, like the idea of augmenting that even in black, so we got those two herds. We got the Clam Lake herd, and we got this new herd um, in Black River Falls. And those, and so the idea for putting those elk there, I think that occurred all before discovery of chronic wasting disease. And that had more to do with like, well, where's their habitat, and where may they not get in as much trouble? I mean, if you put elk in southern Wisconsin, they'll do great until, but there's a there's a, they can get into a lot of trouble, right? Because okay. there's enough agriculture and people around that you know you want to put these big animals where they're, where they're a little less likely to get in trouble. So it, it, it happens to be the case that we don't have chronic wasting disease that we know of very close to any, any of our herds. But, um, yeah, so when we got elk from the state of Kentucky and, and, been, and, and have been bringing those back the last few years, they've been going again to Black River Falls to establish, establish new herd and then up 
in um, Sawyer County to bolster that herd up there. I'm sure that's something you almost you, you probably do similar studies and research on those to make sure that you know to study to see how they're doing and making sure that they're not getting. So yeah, I mean, to, right? every deer that every elk, sorry, every elk that dies does get tested for mm-hmm. chronic wasting disease, and so we haven't had that happen yet. Okay, thankfully, good. Um, it hasn't good. happened yet, and you know, hopefully, it won't. But um, so yeah, that's something that we're definitely paying attention to. One other question I had, and this isn't relation in relation to the elk, but on CWD is if a doe is positive, you know, has contracted CWD, and she. You know, if she drops a fawn, mm-hmm. like within that time period of having having it, will she pass that along to that fawn, or is the state of decline like so rapid that she's just like that's not going to happen? They could. So the what we, what we found through previous research is that your chances of being infected if you're a deer are a lot higher if you have another deer in your family group that's infected. It's not 100 percent though, mm-hmm. so you could skate by. But it's much higher. Is it a certainty? It's probably not a certainty. Gotcha. But it's uh, so it's, it's not, it wouldn't be like passed on like through the blood or no, the placenta or anything no, like that. No, okay. as far as we know, I don't. Uh, it's not either. Doesn't happen or doesn't happen commonly. Okay. Very interesting. A well, good thing. Yeah, that is. That is. Man, that's been some really good information. I think there's a, CWD. Like we said, I mean, it's it's one that people I, they might be aware of, but it, it kind of just escapes your memory. I'd say many times, or you go along not even thinking about it, but it's certainly something that's important to think it se- about. It seems like kind of from first became, or when at least you know when I first became aware of it, like it was like a very heightened focus, and then it's just kind of ebbed and flowed over time, and and now we're at a point where you know people are are putting a, a pretty strong focus on it, which I think is good. Like like to your point, you're, it hasn't made that jump. There's I don't. It doesn't sound like there's concrete things that it for sure will or anything like that, but it's good that you guys are keeping your eye on it. So yeah. Obviously, we care about the deer herd, and as much as as much as you might enjoy going out to kill one at some point in the fall, to you know, as as part of whether it's tradition or for food or all those things, you do then, of course, need to care about their health. And so, uh, yeah, it's yep. good stuff that they that you guys have going on out there. But uh, what do you say we do our our last calls here? I'm ready. All right, last calls. All right. So basically, just Dan. Last call, just kind of whatever is uh, left on your mind. If we missed anything, feel free to pop it well, in now. But well, th- uh, yeah, thanks for having me. If folks are interested in trying to come out with us next year um, to volunteer, um, they can definitely do that. Actually, the one thing I like to say is we've got a newsletter, a project newsletter, so which people can subscribe to and get an email every couple of months, and we'll get updated on project happening. So if you go go to the Wisconsin DNR's website and you type in deer research, you can eventually get there pretty easily and subscribe to our newsletter and that's how we had folks sign up to volunteer there, there we sent out an email 300,000 people I think get it or some huge number of people get that email we had like 800 people sign up within four days and we had to shut shut down our volunteers so if, if people want to do that you know that's a good way to do it and again subscribing to that newsletter is a good way to to keep up to date on the project nice for, for me, it's just, uh, you know, like we kind of found out today, there is a lot still left out there to be discovered about CWD and a lot to be learned. So, you know, whether you're a hunter or whether you're someone who just, you know, wants to learn more about wildlife, just figuring out as much as you can about it, doing your research and trying to learn more is, is a good thing. So, Yeah, I'd say mine is, you know, if, if you're a hunter, I think it's important. We actually talked to this, uh, to the hunting public guys a little bit about this, but Almost like you would if you were in sports watching film on another team. It's good if you're if you're going to be a hunter someday to study the animals that you're going to be hunting. And what better way to really study and get into the mind of a deer than if you go out and you do uh, something like this with the DNR, like a fawn search. You know, because that really got me thinking, I know, because I'd be like, you'd be walking through and you might see, uh, you might find a fawn and then you backtrack in your head like, well, why was the fawn there? You know, and then like, why did the doe go to that spot and then you know you you just start putting connecting the dots and then when you're driving around you're looking for these you start seeing deer out in fields and you're like okay well why is the deer there what is it about the habitat there that makes it it attractive to a deer and so not only are you having a great time when you're out there you can bring the whole family along there were young old guys gals but you can also get in some good sort of uh i call it film film sesh you know <laughs> but studying in on just deer in general yeah. and for for the next time you go out in the fall so super cool and yeah. yeah it was it was a lot of fun yeah it was fascinating stuff man so my last call is uh personally i am going to be diligent about 
getting my deer tested from now on because I've been kind of remiss in doing that. You know, generally I'm so excited to, you know, get it in the freezer and, you know, eat tenderloins for breakfast yep. or something like that. And uh, either for, you know, quote, potential health reasons, but but more so just for you guys to, to get that data. And I think it's important for a lot of people to be thinking about that is to, to get that deer tested because the more deer that get tested, the more information you guys have or, or any state agency and... Um, you know, information is, is power, and that's good stuff to have. So, Look, man, I've downed a lot of your venison sticks, and you're telling me. <laughs> you were rolling the dice, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, well, I'm not going down alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, you and maybe you don't have the uh, seals for down there, but. <laughs> we're anyway. all still kicking. Yeah, we're, we are. We are still kicking. But for those, uh, those listening, thank you again, and always let us know. What you guys want to hear on the Vortex Nation podcast here, it's been great having Dan out from the DNR. And uh, like we said, actually, we briefly alluded to it. Maybe we'll talk to them about the Elk Project here in Wisconsin and, and hopefully partner up with them and, and, and uh, do a few other interesting things. And, uh, you know, just all in the name of conserving our, our natural resources and continuing to do what it is that we love doing, which is hunting, fishing, shooting, all that good stuff. So thanks again, everybody, for listening. And uh, we'll see you next time. All right, that'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. Leave us a review or comment down below. We want to hear what you have to say about the show, maybe what you like, maybe what you didn't like, so that way we can make these podcasts as good as they can be. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'll be posting about each episode released, so that way you can go back, find these things, maybe grab a little nugget of information that you could take with you to the range, out in the field, or uh, maybe to the kitchen if we're talking about some good food. So, again, everybody, thanks, and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.